Bamboo Bridge is an urban village in Lancashire, England, just five kilometers from Preston. In 1979, the village had a population of around 10,000 people. Living in the small town was a 14-year-old boy named Alan Livesey. Alan was the youngest of his two siblings, Derek and Janet. He lived with his parents, Bob and Margaret Livesey, in number 41, The Crescent. The Crescent was a cluster of homes lined up in a semicircle off of Collins Street in Bamber Bridge. Everybody knew everyone else in the area and crime was almost non-existent. However, in 1979, this relatively quiet village was witness to a horrific murder which shocked the people living in and around Lancashire for decades to come. On the 22nd of February, 1979, Alan's father, Bob Livesey, left for his night shift at a nearby business called Leyland Motors. Alan had his evening meal at around 6.30 p.m. His mother, Margaret Livesey, ventured out around 8.50 p.m. in order to meet up with a friend, Marianne Walker, for a drink at the Queen's Hotel pub. Unbeknownst to her husband, Margaret was also meeting up with a man at the bar with whom she'd been secretly having an affair. Not much is known of what happened that night, but what is known is that 14-year-old Alan was home alone from 8.50 p.m. onwards. He had been grounded by his parents for taking a car and crashing it. He had apparently done this in a protest for not being allowed to go out to a youth disco with his friends. Around 11 p.m., Margaret was dropped off by her secret lover, Frank Bamber, at the top of Collins Road North. She was walking down the road towards her house when she noticed two young boys lurking around on the street next to Mrs. Matthews' house, number 63. She recognized the two adolescents. They were Andrew Matthews and Tommy Rogers. She knew that the two teenagers, residents of the Crescent, had been getting in trouble with the police as of recent, and their shenanigans had included her own son, Alan, who had recently been in trouble for illegally driving and damaging various automobiles. Alan's mother also believed that he had been involved with shoplifting. Margaret knew that the two teenagers should not have been out at that time of night, so she decided to let Mrs. Matthews know that her son, Andrew, was outside their home. Upon seeing Margaret, the two boys ran away. Nonetheless, Margaret knocked on Mrs. Matthews' door to let her know about Andrew and found both Mrs. Matthews and Mrs. Rogers, Tommy's mother, in the house having a drink. Mrs. Matthews offered Margaret a drink and the woman sat down to chat. A few minutes later, Mrs. Matthews' older son, Leslie, arrived home. Mrs. Matthews asked Leslie to go outside to find Andrew and Mrs. Rogers' son, Tommy. Leslie went out to look for them but could not find them anywhere and returned home empty-handed. Margaret then asked him to go check on Alan. She reasoned that maybe the boys were with him. Leslie went to the Livesey home and knocked on the door but no one answered. He tried to peek through the window but could not see anyone in the house. However, the TV was on. He went back to his home and told Margaret that no one had answered the door. Margaret thought Alan may have fallen asleep and simply left the TV on. She gave Leslie her house keys and asked him to go in and check up on Alan. Leslie headed back to Alan's house and opened the door. As soon as he entered the house, he was met with what he described as a quote, funny smell. He realized the house was filled with gas. He then made his way to the fireplace where he found Alan laying face down on the carpet between the sofa and the fireplace. He was dressed in his youth army uniform and had his hands tied behind his back. Leslie rolled Alan over and realized he was all wet. He noticed a red sock around his neck. As Leslie removed the sock, he saw multiple cuts and gashes around his neck. 
He was horrified. He tried doing CPR, but nothing positive happened and blood spurted out of the wounds on Alan's neck. Leslie immediately went back to his home and notified Margaret. Both headed back to the home, and after seeing Alan's body, Margaret Livesey dropped to her knees and said, quote, Oh, Alan, oh, Alan. Margaret then tried to close Alan's eyes and said, quote, I don't want him to die with his eyes open. But this attempt was unsuccessful. Leslie tried to open the windows as there was gas throughout the home, but Margaret instructed him to call police immediately. Leslie went to the nearest phone booth and called police. The call was placed at 11.28 p.m. and is the only reliable time check in the entire timeline of the crime. The killer had turned on all the gas taps, but after finding Alan's lifeless body, Margaret promptly turned them off. When the police arrived just three minutes later at 11.31 p.m., the house was full of gas. So all the windows were opened to clear the gas, which resulted in difficulty in estimating the exact time of death for Alan, as when the window was opened, it let cold air into the home. One of the methods used by pathologists in the 1970s in order to determine the time of death was by checking the body temperature. Alan's body had been first subjected to gas and then to cold temperature, which meant that by the time the body was examined at 2.40 p.m., the different temperatures interfered with determining the time of death. During their investigation, police could not find any sign of a struggle. There was no blood spatter on the floor nor on the walls nearby. There was blood on the carpet around the body, but no sign of blood on the furniture nor on the fireplace. If Alan had been attacked while standing, there would have been blood splatter on the wall around the body. Alan's clothing was rumpled, his vest and jersey pushed up towards his chest. This suggested that the killer had sat astride him and possibly had tortured him with the point of a knife before forcefully plunging it into his neck. Six of the stabbings were deep gashes, while the other four were superficial nicks, inflicted by the tip of the knife, one of which was a cut upon his eyelid. It seemed that the knife was placed on his eyelid, gently, and then pressed down with just enough force to cut the skin. The red socks that were found around his neck had multiple cuts on them, suggesting that Alan had it around his neck during the stabbing and was stabbed through the socks. This explained why there were no blood spatters around the body. Alan's wrists had been bound with a necktie. The tie had been looped around both wrists and tied in the middle, bringing the wrists close together. It then went around each wrist individually and tied again. The two ends were then secured by a reef knot. The strangest artifact of the scene, however, was Alan's uniform. His mother told police that Alan had been wearing trousers and a jumper when she left the home around 8.50 p.m., but now he was wearing his army cadet uniform and his new boots. He was a keen army cadet and had joined in 1977. Police did not believe that this was a frenzied murder made in the moment of extreme anger, but that of a vicious game gone terribly wrong. The police searched the front as well as the backyards of all the homes in the Crescent, hoping to find the murder weapon, but to no avail. Police questioned friends and family, as well as neighbors. The neighbors told police that they had heard noises coming from the Livesey's home, but they could not remember the exact time. Neighbors said that Alan had a habit of having other boys in his home whenever he was alone. The day after the murder, a witness by the name of Peter Nightingale came forward and told police that on the night of the murder, at around 10 p.m., he had left his friend's house in order to walk to his sister's home. His sister, Susan Warren, was the next-door neighbor of the Livesey's. Peter said that as he was climbing the back fence to go to his sister's back garden, he heard the kitchen door of the Livesey's being closed. He then saw a man walking down the back garden pathway, hopping over a fence and disappearing. Peter described the man to be about 5 feet 10 inches tall, with whitish blonde hair which bounced when he walked. Peter believed that the man was probably wearing an anorak, 
as he heard the sound of the material rubbing against his arms. Peter's sister, Susan Warren, who lived next door, was also interviewed by police. Susan said that she did not hear anything during the early part of the evening, but when she was putting her daughter to sleep just before 10 p.m., she heard a voice from Alan's home. She said that it seemed like Alan was fooling around with someone. Later, she heard Margaret shouting, he's bloody dead, when Alan's body was found. Susan Warren's boyfriend, Ronald Mason, was also interviewed. He too stated that he had heard the same noise around 9.55 p.m. He was sure of the timing because he had just finished watching The Streets of San Francisco, a TV series. He described the noise as, quote, various shouts and had believed that Alan was fooling around with somebody. Later, he too heard Margaret's voice when Alan's body was found. With the eyewitness statements, the police initially believed Alan was killed by someone he was hanging around with that night, probably by a friend. Police then visited Alan's school and the local army cadet headquarters in order to interview anybody who may have had knowledge about the murder, but no leads were acquired. Initially, police thought that a young man, around 5 foot 10 inches tall, may have been responsible for the crime. He was described as having white blonde hair and was possibly someone who hung around the LGBT scene. However, a few days later, police completely dropped that theory with no further details given to the media, other than the fact that police were now completely shifting their focus and turning their sights on a new suspect, Alan's own mother. Margaret Livesey. Margaret would become a prime suspect after her two next door neighbors provided additional details, which they had not shared with the police in their initial interviews. Christine Norris was the right side neighbor of Margaret, while Susan Warren was the neighbor on the left. While Susan's home was attached to Margaret's house by the common wall, Christine's house was detached from the Livesey home. Christine was also interviewed by the police early on in the investigation. She had claimed that she had not heard anything that night except for when the police finally arrived at 11.31 p.m. She did not have much to say and the police did not even bother to take her written statement at that time. But four days later, Christine talked to Susan and changed her story. In fact, both women changed their stories. Christine now claimed that she had actually heard a violent argument between Alan and his mother at around 10.45 or 10.50 p.m. on the night of the murder. Christine said that she was reading a book until 10.30 p.m. and remembered hearing voices from the Livesey home. She even said that she heard Alan cry out, quote, help me. She also told police that the relationship between mother and son were strained. She said that Margaret would give her son, quote, irritable slaps. She also claimed that the NSPCC had received reports about Margaret's alleged cruelty to Alan. The NSPCC is a child protective service aimed at preventing further child abuse. The agency talked with the boy, but he denied that his mother had hit him and did not show any signs of physical abuse. Christine also alleged that Margaret would lock Alan in his bedroom for hours upon end and that she would see him sliding down the drain pipe in order to get out of the house. When asked why she did not tell the police about this in her earlier interview, she said that she did not want to get involved. However, when she talked to her mother and to Susan Warren, she decided to come forward. Susan Warren would also be re-interviewed and she too changed her story. She repeated her original story, but also said that she had heard Alan and his mother arguing between 10.45 p.m. and 10.50 p.m. She also claimed that she had heard Alan's head being banged against the wall. In the second interview, she also corroborated Christine's NSPCC story. Ronald Mason, Susan's boyfriend, stuck to his story throughout the subsequent interviews and said he did not hear Alan nor Margaret fighting that night. On February 27th, five days after Alan's murder, Margaret Livesey was brought to the police station for questioning. She gave the same statement as she had in her previous interview. 
She said she was dropped off by Frank Bamber at the top of Collins Road North around 11 p.m. and then went to the Matthews home. The police, however, told her that her neighbors had heard her arguing with Alan at 10.45 p.m. Margaret denied it. When asked why the neighbors would believe that she would be shouting at Alan in the days prior to his murder, Margaret replied that, as a teenager, he was always wanting something and often did not do as he was told. She said that she had been worried about him as she had found six new batteries in his coat pocket, which she believed had been shoplifted. The police then alleged that on the night of the murder, Margaret had been angry about Alan, so she'd gone straight back to her home and, in a heated argument with her son, murdered Alan. They then alleged that she'd cleaned up the murder weapon, a knife, turned on the gas taps, and walked the long way around the crescent, thus entering Mrs. Matthews' home. Margaret denied it and started crying. She then replied, quote, well, if you said that I have done it, then I must have, but I cannot remember. Margaret was visibly distraught and confused and started asking silly questions. She asked the investigators what her husband would think of all this. She also said that she could not go back to her house at number 41 The Crescent and asked if they thought that she should get a new home on Clayton Brook. The interview went on for four hours, with Margaret ultimately confessing to murdering her own son. According to the police, she said that when she had come home, she walked into the living room, and Alan was wearing his cadet uniform, laying on the carpet watching TV. She figured that he had gone out of the house despite being grounded. She said that Alan denied breaking his grounded status. The investigator then asked her what she did next. Margaret reportedly replied, quote, I stabbed him and stabbed him. She said that she had used the kitchen knife, which she uses for peeling potatoes. She said that she then covered his neck as she did not want to look at all the blood. Police supposed that she must have tied Alan up to make it look like someone else had broken into the home and murdered him. Margaret was arrested and charged with Alan's murder. She made a statement and signed it, but within three days, she retracted her confession and said that she had been coerced by police. She stated that she was confused, shocked, and debilitated, and that the police convinced her that she had done it. She said that for a moment, she even believed it herself. The police went to the Livesey home and this time collected all the knives in the house. One of the knives seemed to have matched the murder weapon which the police had been looking for. This knife was found in the kitchen drawer. The knife had a wooden handle and one of the rivets from the handle was missing. However, a forensic examination of the knife did not reveal any traces of blood. The police seemed to have given up on the theory about a man with whitish blonde hair, as described by neighbor Peter Nightingale, and instead they were completely focused on Alan's mother. On March 3rd, Peter's brother, Raymond Nightingale, was questioned, and he told police that Peter had come to him and told him that he had never seen anybody leaving the Livesey home. He said that he had lied to the police because he was frightened. Peter was again questioned, and he confirmed that he had lied to the police in his previous interview. He said that he did not see anyone coming out of the Livesey home at 10 p.m., the police eliminated the whitish blonde man theory and focused only on Margaret. Margaret was put on trial on July 2nd, 1979 in Preston Crown Court in Lancashire. Margaret had to undergo two trials, both at Preston Crown Court. The jury at the first trial had looked at all the evidence and the confession by Margaret, which had been withdrawn. The jury also heard statements from both women, Christine Norris and Susan Warren. The defense highlighted that both women had not told police the whole truth in their initial interview. The defense argued that both women either withheld information or lied about it because they did not want to be involved. The defense also said that the timing of Susan's statements did not match. Susan, in her second interview, had claimed that she had heard an argument between Alan and his mother around 10.45 or 10.50 p.m. She claims she remembered the time because she was watching the show The City at Risk and that it was almost near the end of the show that she had heard the argument. She said the program had ended at 11 p.m. 
However, the defense was able to prove that the program had actually ended at 11.15 p.m., which meant that the noise or the argument that Susan heard was actually after 11 p.m. The defense argued that she most likely had heard the panicked voices of Leslie Matthew and Margaret when they found the body of Alan. During her statements, the judge had asked Susan why she'd given two different statements to the police when she did not want to get involved in the murder case. It was understandable, she said, that Susan may have not wanted to say anything, but why then go and say two different statements? The judge was curious how that prevented Susan from not becoming involved. Susan reportedly said, quote, I do not know, really. Christine stuck to her statement that she indeed had heard arguing between mother and son between 10.30 and 11 p.m. as she had looked at the digital clock in her bedroom. Ronald Mason, Susan's boyfriend, stuck to his previous statement and denied hearing anything except the sound of what he described as Alan fooling around with someone around 10 p.m. He says he did not hear any arguments that night. Peter Nightingale was also called to the stand. He now reverted back to his original story of seeing a man with whitish blonde hair coming out of the Livesey home. He said that the police had pressured him into retracting his statement. He also said that he only said his statement was a lie so that he could leave the police station. He now stated that he was pretty sure he had seen a man with whitish blonde hair leaving the Livesey home around 10 p.m. Margaret's friend, who was with her in the pub the night of the murder, Marion Walker, and Margaret's secret lover, Frank Bamber, were also called to the court. Frank Bamber said that they had not left the pub's car park until about 10.50 p.m. Marion Walker confirmed this and said that she had left them both around 10.50 p.m. at the car park when Frank was cleaning off the ice from his windshield. The journey from the pub to the top of Collins Road would have taken around four and a half minutes. This meant Margaret arrived at the top of Collins Road a few minutes prior to 11 p.m., or even at 11 p.m. Frank recalls that he spoke with Margaret for about a minute or two while Margaret finished her cigarette and left the car. The prosecution argued that Margaret left the car and went straight home, a journey that would have taken her two minutes and 20 seconds. Prosecutors claim that she then argued with Alan, tortured him, stabbed him 10 times, tied him up, washed off the knife, and turned on the gas taps. They then allege that she walked around the Crescent towards the Matthews home, a walk that would have taken about 2 minutes and 40 seconds. Margaret's husband, Bob, was also called in for questioning, and he said that his wife had a bad temper and had lied to him on numerous occasions regarding domestic matters, such as paying bills. This had led to several arguments between the couple. After hearing all the evidence and statements presented, it was clear the jury was divided on Margaret's guilt. But during the first trial, a close relative of one of the jurors had become ill and he had been excused from the jury. This resulted in a new trial, which was called in just eight days after the first trial, in the same city and in the same court. In the second trial, Susan, based on prior questioning in the first trial, knew about the discrepancy in her statements regarding the timing of the argument in accordance with the timing of the television show. So this time, she said that she had actually heard the arguments much earlier, sometime between 10.30 and 11 p.m. Mrs. Matthews also changed the timing of her story and said that Margaret had actually arrived at her home around 11.10 p.m. and not at 11 p.m. as she had originally claimed in her statement to police. While the first jury could not reach a consensus after two days of deliberation, the second jury took less than five hours and found Margaret guilty of the murder. She was sentenced to life in prison, despite the witnesses changing their statements at the drop of a hat. In 1983, the BBC show Rough Justice aired an episode featuring the case, called, quote, The Case of the Tortured Teenager. The show examined all the evidence and came to the conclusion that Margaret had been wrongfully convicted. The show interviewed the neighbors, Susan Warren and Christine Norris, and they again changed their stories. They now said that they likely heard the noises after 11 p.m., probably when Leslie and Margaret found Alan's body. 
The show also found another witness, John Kershaw, who claimed that he saw Margaret at the entrance of the Crescent at 11.01 p.m. He had given his statements to the police, but he was never called as a witness to the court. The show also went over the movements of Andrew Matthews and Tommy Rogers, as they had seen Margaret knocking on Miss Matthews' door the night of the murder, prior to running away. Andrew had been at the local disco with his friend Tommy Rogers. They left the club and noticed the clock at the job center at the center of Bamber Bridge. The time was 10.55 p.m. It would have taken them about eight minutes or less to reach home. Andrew and Tommy arrived home and crept under the window to see what was going on in the house, as his mother had not given him permission to go to the disco. Andrew was trying to sneak upstairs to his bedroom without getting caught by his mother when he noticed Margaret coming towards the house. That would put Margaret at Miss Matthews' home around 11.03 p.m. to 11.05 p.m. It would have been simply impossible for Margaret to arrive at the top of Crescent at 11 p.m., then walk or even run the two minute and 20 second walk to her house first, torture and murder Alan, clean the murder weapon, turn on the gas taps, and then walk or run to Mrs. Matthews' home and still be at the house at 11.03 to 11.05. There was another small detail which the prosecutors had overlooked. When Leslie Matthews arrived at the Livesey home, he had smelled gas in the house. This, they believed, was obviously done by the killer so that whomever entered the home would cause an explosion, destroying the incriminating evidence. If Margaret had killed Alan and opened up all the gas taps, why would she ask Leslie Matthews to check up on Alan, the only one in the home who did not smoke? The murderer most likely was hoping whomever entered the home was either already smoking or would light a cigarette after entering the house. Margaret did smoke cigarettes frequently, so possibly the killer knew Margaret would be the one to enter the house, thus causing an explosion. Another minor detail that was overlooked was the fact that Margaret had tried to close Alan's eyes after his body was found, but was unable to. It is normal for the eyes to become rigid after an hour to an hour and a half after death due to rigor mortis. So, if Alan had died at 11 p.m. or even between 10.45 to 11 p.m., Margaret should have still been able to close Alan's eyes. Mrs. Matthews and Mrs. Rogers, who had had a drink with Margaret, were also asked if they had noticed anything unusual about her. They both said they did not notice anything out of ordinary about the mother. They were then asked if they had seen blood splashes on Margaret, and both women denied seeing any blood. There were plenty of other details and evidence which had either been overlooked or not presented at the trial by prosecution. The first detail overlooked was the fact that prosecutors alleged Margaret had cleaned the knife that was found in the Livesey home, which they believed was the murder weapon. The knife in question had a missing rivet. If it had been used in the attack, it surely would have been stained with blood, but forensic analysis did not find any traces of blood. It would have been impossible for Margaret to completely clean the knife as, due to the missing rivet and the looseness of the hilt, the blood would have gone into the crevices of the wooden handle and would have still remained within the handle of the knife no matter how much one tried to clean it. If that knife was not the murder weapon, then where was it? The Crescent had been thoroughly searched by police, but the murder weapon was still not found. At no time did Margaret leave the Crescent either. It was a mystery how police would suppose that Margaret got rid of the murder weapon when she never left the crime scene. The show Rough Justice consulted Professor James Cameron, Secretary General of the British Academy of Forensic Sciences. He believed that the murder involved homosexual bondage, and that Alan may have consented to tying his hands and having someone sit on him. The killer then slowly dragged the knife over his body before inflicting serious deep cuts. This theory was based on the superficial injuries sustained by Alan. Professor Cameron reviewed the pathology report. He stated that from the pathologist's findings taken at 2.40 a.m., Based on the temperature of the body and the presence of rigor mortis, the muscle stiffness after death, along with the way in which the blood had pooled into the dependent parts of the body, suggested to him that the murder had actually taken place about five hours earlier. This would place the murder around the time of 10 to 10.30. 
He also stated that the report cites little digestion of the stomach contents. And as Allen had had his last meal around 6 p.m., the professor estimated that Allen had died approximately three to four hours after his last meal, which would put the time of death around 9.30 to 10.30 p.m. He believes that the time of death is around 10 p.m. This would coincide with the noises heard by Susan Warren and Ronnie Mason. It would also coincide with the sighting of the whitish blonde-haired man by Peter Nightingale. The show also found evidence, which was neither tested for forensic analysis nor presented during the court trial. Police had found three packets of cigarettes in the home, all from different brands. One Dunhill cigarette packet, which Margaret and Bob used to smoke. One which was an unopened player's number six packet, which was occasionally a brand smoked by Allen. But the third was most significant. The third pack of cigarettes, a pack of Benson and Hedges, were found laying on the carpet about two feet from Allen and were never presented to the court nor to the defense lawyers. No one in the house smoked Benson and Hedges. This was only later noticed in the photographs taken by the crime scene photographer. In the crime scene photographs, they also noticed several cigarette butts in the ashtray on a table near the body, but those were never forensically tested either. Another thing to note is the supposed confession by Margaret herself. In her confession, she stated that she stabbed Alan in the neck and put the sock on his neck afterwards because she could not bear to see him bleeding. However, the sock had cuts on them, suggesting that the killer had put them on before stabbing Alan in the throat. Moreover, Margaret claimed that she had tied Alan up after the murder, even though investigators believe Alan was tied beforehand and had had someone sit astride him. It was also questionable how police could justify the expertise in the knot tying. The binding on the teen's hands, complete with the reef knot, were unlike anything that the mother Margaret was capable of. Over the years, people have come up with their own theories. Some point to a copy of the Daily Mirror newspaper present in the room where Alan died, which featured torture methods utilized by paramilitary groups. If Alan and his friend had read this, that could explain why he was in his army cadet uniform and positioned so strangely. Some in the community wondered if this was a case of boyish roughhousing gone terribly wrong. Might the Daily Mirror article have inspired their own experimentations? It was theorized that the presence of the socks on Alan's neck could have been to shield him from actual stab wounds, but being teenagers, the boys did not realize that the knife would penetrate the sock. In this speculation, it is thought that Alan may have willingly laid on the floor in order to roleplay such torture tactics, which would explain the lack of blood splatter on the wall or on the fireplace, as this would mean Alan would have started in a supine position. Margaret Livesey remained in prison until 1989. Her case was reinvestigated in 1983 by West Yorkshire Police and taken to the Court of Appeals in 1986, but each concluded that the verdict was correct. Margaret was released from prison in 1989 on life parole. She moved to Surrey to live near her daughter Janet. In 2000, she returned to Lancashire to live in a sheltered accommodation in Walton Liddale. She died of throat cancer four months later. She protested her innocence to her grave. The case would remain dormant without any updates until 2016. In 2016, a forensic review was opened into the case, with detectives investigating the case further to see if they needed to reopen it. The outcome so far has been unknown. Unknown.